Hey, this is Steve Bell. Welcome to the MedTech Mavericks podcast. Um, I've been asked to do this one by several people who've asked me to do a review of different robots that are out there other than just DaVinci 5 and the obvious DaVinci clones and the different soft tissue surgical ro robots. Um, so I decided today to do uh, a series of these and I'm going to start today with Procept, um, Procept Biorobotics, which is, um, we'll get into it in a minute, but it's 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 a robot um that's very different than something like a da Vinci. So again, the problem with robotics is it's a catch-all phrase. And most robots are actually not robots in any way, shape, or form. Um, but they have robotic components to them, so therefore they get classed as a robot. Um, and um, the classic, let me just go to here uh, and pull this up for you, is that you would all be used to seeing um, this as a robot this is what you'd all be used to seeing this is what you'd all think as a robot it's the da vinci oh let me keep on that for a while don't move it's the da vinci robot a multi-arm robot for soft tissue robotics but to be honest that is not the only um the only type of robot that's out there so you you've also got a um a series of different robots that I'm going to cover over the next coming uh, weeks and months. And in my blog, uh, already I've started to cover things like endoluminal robots. And today's robot, in some senses, is an endoluminal robot. Um, they may not classify it as that, but it is a form of endoluminal robot. I'm also going to cover the endovascular robots, the neurovascular robots, the spine robots, the large joint robots. I'm going to cover them all because they've all got merits and they all work in a different way. And people who are working in spine, for example, will know the spine robots, whereas those working in soft tissue robotics may not know so much about the spine robots. So I'm going to try and do this. Now, again, these do take me quite a bit of time to do, and it is in my own time that I do this. So um, I'm going to ask now, uh, one thing that I would really ask that you do to really help me and support my channel is a few things. So on the YouTube channel, what will really help me is, is if you follow the channel and that'll push the video out to more people. And it'll also give you um, the videos when I upload them, it will automatically notify you the videos are there. The second thing that helps me is that if you like the video and if you can go back and like some of my other videos, that again tells the algorithm of YouTube to push out my videos to more people. Uh, so more people get to see them and share with the information. The final thing that I'd ask as a big request is that um, I do have my blog as well, and you may have come to this via my blog, which is on how to start up in medtech.com. Um, I would ask that you go there and go to the blog, and there's a free section, which is fine, and you'll get some information in the free section like this video today. But there are also uh, the exclusive deep dives, and they do take me a lot of um, time, effort, and research to get those done, but they will contain masses of information. And if you're into this scene, if you're, if you're in marketing or sales, or you're an investor, or there's just a different you know, role that you've got in surgical robotics or med tech, I would sign up for it. It's 20 euros a year that gives you full access to every single article that's in there, plus all the past ones would encourage you to go back and look at the past articles as well. And I'm starting to build up a framework and a picture of soft tissue surgical robotics. And now I'm gonna go more into the other robotics as well. So that anyone in this industry will get information. And some of this information, you would pay up to $10,000 for a report from a um, probably less informed uh, research company that is basically just sort of throwing out the research uh, on this. If you follow my blog for $20 a year, 20 euros a year, uh, you should be able to get as much information as you'd find in most reports. Um, so that would help me a lot. So YouTube, follow that. Right, uh, publicity over with now. What we're gonna talk about today is we are gonna talk about um, different robots and the one that i'm going to talk about today actually is from a company called procept bio robotics and you may have heard this this is the aqua ablation which is here which is the aqua ablation therapy and we'll talk about that in some details in a minute and this is their new um, version for their aqua ablation robot which they call hydros robotic system and as you might see they've obviously put the words ai powered in there because you can't do anything today in robotics without a bit of ai power right um 
again, as I've talked about uh, on the AI 2M conference, you've got to be careful what AI actually means. But yeah, there, there is actually some machine learning back here that's going to help. And I'll get into that later. And I will explain what this robot is about. But you can't help noticing that it feels actually very much like the Da Vinci 5 in terms of design cues. And I don't think that there was any copying going on by either of them forwards or backwards. But what you're seeing now on a lot of the robots is these large touchscreen formatted um, devices, you know, beautiful industrial design, really nice color so that it's going to be used in low light uh, ambience. Um, and there's going to be, you know, touch screens for the user and the operator uh, so that it makes workflow easier and faster. And we'll get into in a bit the imaging that you get with this system and the um, ultrasound image that you get as a companion and then how the AI works in this. The first thing that I need to do, though, is, is take us a little bit. Um, I need to take us a little bit into the disease state that this um, that this covers today because it's it's actually a very specific disease today i think they're going to expand into several others in the future um, but let me talk about the disease state first which is benign prostate hyperplasia and what that just means is that benign means it's non-cancerous um, it's a in the prostate so it's a disease that affects men um, and it's hyperplasia, which means you've got extra cell growth that you didn't want to have. And basically what happens is you've got you, you've got basically got um, a prostate is like sort of like a big apple like this. Oh, sorry, bang the microphone. There's an apple like this and there's a there's a there's a central lumen and that connects to the bladder. Um, get, I'll get a bit more into this in a minute. I'll show you some diagrams, but that's connects to the bladder and your urine passes through the prostate. That's one of the fluids that passes through the prostate. And that's how you basically pee, right? So what happens is that the 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 tissue starts growing and growing and you get this hyperplasia or this you know enlarged prostate. And what happens is the lumen gets closed down. And that can cause problems with um, with evacuating the bladder, which is basically urinary retention. So it becomes hard for the guys to pee. And as they get older with this, it gets worse and worse. And it's 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 not life threatening in most cases, um, but it's very dis it's got a great amount of discomfort for men. And um, basically, it's very symptomatic. And, and some of that gets treated today. There's some different um, pharmaceutical treatments that give symptom relief. Um, and then I'll dig into a little bit about the treatments that have been done over the years. And in fact, let me jump to my main scene and let me uh, jump to a few things here. So let's go here to, uh, uh, let's not go that one. Let's go here first. This is quite a nice little animation that I found on YouTube. And this talks about the most common way that this is treated today. So basically, you've got this extra growth that's in there. And what you're going to do is you're going to go in and you're going to remove some tissue. And the one of the key ways that tissue has been removed for multiple years by urologists is that they go in with a cystoscope and they have like a, you'll see in a minute, it's like a, a semi-lunar hook. And what they basically do is they put electrosurgical energy through it and they burn away and scrape away tissue in little slithers uh, is probably the best way for me to say it. But let, let, let's, let's jump in on this a minute and, and just see where it goes. And, and, and I'll help you to see. Uh, Transurethal resection of the prostate or TERP is a surgical procedure during which part of the prostate gland is removed. The prostate is a walnut-sized gland in men that is located at the base of the bladder where it wraps around the urethra. A TERP is often performed for a condition called benign prostatic hyperplasia. In this non-cancerous condition, the prostate enlarges to the point of causing difficulty with urination. Now, I want you to think about this a little bit because um, anyone who's watching this who's ever, ever had a blocked drain... Um, there are going to be some uh, comparisons here, and Procept's going to hate me for saying this, but I really, for, I know that I have a lot of non-technical users that come to my, come to my um, podcasts and my, my blog. So I just want to make sure that I also put this in simple non-medical terms so that people can understand it a little bit more. But imagine that you've got a drain and it's blocked inside. We're going to talk a little bit later about how how they often get unblocked by uh, some of the drain companies. A TERP may also be performed in patients with prostate cancer to relieve bladder obstruction. When you arrive at the hospital... For 
But we're going to talk today about the benign. Uh, we are not going to talk today for Procept, uh, but we will talk a little bit about where they're probably going to go. Um, that that might be used in cancer in the future, but today it's used in the benign uh, prostate hyperplasia. Surgery. An intravenous line will be started. You may be given antibiotics to decrease your chance of infection. A TERP may be performed under general or spinal anesthesia. If you're given general anesthesia, you will be unconscious and a breathing tube will be inserted into your throat to help you breathe for the duration of the operation. If you receive spinal anesthesia, you will remain conscious and the lower half of your body will be numb during the operation. You'll be given sedation to help you relax. Now, me being an utter and total coward, uh, I will be saying, give me everything, knock me out, take me out of here. I don't want to know a single thing about it. Personal choice. Uncomplicated TERP usually takes about an hour to perform. Your surgeon will begin by slipping a small lighted instrument called a cystoscope through the opening of your penis. After instilling sterile solution no, through the cystoscope for better visibility, your surgeon will carefully examine the inside of your urethra, prostate, and bladder. He or she will then pass a resectoscope, which essentially consists of a small wire loop carrying an electric current through the cystoscope and use it to shave off layers of prostate tissue. The now that's looking quite gentle there. It's, uh, if you, well, I might even try and find one later, but, but basically that's got a, a lot of uh, high voltage electricity and this is often monopolar. So it's passing through the, through the tissues. And you've got to think about that. It's causing electrical spread and it's causing thermal spread, which is what we'll come to a little bit later of why there's alternatives to it. It will be washed into the bladder and out through a special port in the cystoscope. When an optimal amount of prostate tissue has been excised, your surgeon will remove the cystoscope and place a catheter into your bladder to keep it draining for up to two days after the surgery. Following the procedure, you will be taken to the recovery area for monitoring and given pain medication as needed. You may continue to receive antibiotics through your intravenous line and a sterile solution may be flushed intermittently through the catheter tube to wash out accumulated blood and clots. So there we go. So basically uh, what we're doing there is we're, we're going into the prostate and we are um, going in with this hook, we're basically resecting away. And, and that's, that's been done for you know, decades that way. The, the problem with that is a little bit is you've got to understand a little bit more of the anatomy around the prostate, which is um, it's actually more delicate than people think because you've got around there, you've got you've got se several problems. So not only do do you have the the urine that passes through it, but there's also it's got the seminal, seminal vesicles that come to it and they basically have seminal fluid. So it's, it's part of the reproductive system as well. And it's it has. Um, a lot of people don't understand quite how it, this, this works, but but the prostate, it, it, it actually helps with continence. So um, it helps to make sure that you don't have leakage of urine when you don't want leakage of urine. And what can happen is that when you, when you do the TURP, either from taking too much tissue away or nerve damage, you can actually cause an amount of incontinence um, with that procedure. Um, and that's sometimes because of th excess thermal damage. Sometimes it's nerve damage because you've got elect electricity in there. But what it can also do is it, it can also allow retrograde ejaculation. So you can have um, seminal fluid go back up into the bladder, which is a another problem of this. And sometimes then it can even cause erectile dysfunction. So this sexual dysfunction that comes with this, and that's one of the main measures. Because it's not going to necessarily kill you, but it's uncomfortable, it's that trade-off for a man of, do I want to potentially risk incontinence and sexual dysfunction or do I want to put up with some symptoms and have problems peeing that's basically um sort of what happens in the minds of a lot of men as they as they think about do they want this treatment or not so that's 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 kind of the treatment that's been done that's the focus of Procept that what they're doing is bringing a new way of attacking this uh, disease and I'll talk about that in detail in a minute I want to say that over the last 30 years there's been several therapies that have been tried to um, replace TURP transurethral resection of prostate so there's been things like uh, there's been two or three different lasers made including indigo which came from J&J &J, and there was green light laser which came from AMS and they what they were trying to do was use um, low, low level laser energy to um, to basically reduce and debulk 
the tissue that was in there. But the problem with these things is that they often came back because you sort of debulked them, but then they, they came back in. Then they tried even things like the Theraseed, which was using small radioactive um, pellets that were placed in and around the tissue to cause the tissue to retract. That was tried. Uh, there's been multiple different approaches that have been done towards this. So roll forwards, and you came to the, the, the point of uh, Procept. And let's talk a little bit about Procept. Let me get to my main C scene here and jump in on Procept. So Procept Biorobotics, they've been around for uh, about oh, well over a decade. And what they did is they said, well, actually, you could use cryo or you could use thermal, but the problem with all of those is that they have collateral spread. So, um, and this is where they're gonna hate me on this, but basically, if you think about the way that several drain companies come and unblock a drain, so, um, one of them is they come with a mechanical thing, which would be the equivalent of a turp, and they go in and they, they'll unblock your drain by basically um, rot rotivating through it. But then what a lot of them do as well is they actually use high-pressure water. Um, so they, they have like a super high-pressure nozzle that fires forwards and backwards. And what that nozzle does is it basically it breaks away the soft stuff that's inside the drain, uh, and the block and it softens it up and it, and it breaks it away and what it does though is it's selective it doesn't rip through your actual drain that's one of the key things so the interesting thing about high pressure water is that it's it's quite selective on tissue so it'll take softer tissue but it won't take things so much like nerves and blood vessels depending on how you uh, regulate the pressure so you need a little bit of smarts in there to regulate the pressure and the direction of the jet and the shape of the jet that comes out of it but basically what they do in in drains is they push that up and it, it basically pushes all the stuff out of the drain so that's in basic the, the concept a little bit here but it's a way smarter with the way they do it with Procept and I'll get into that in a minute let me just be clear though that the idea of using water on tissue has been around since about 1988 and here's some old stuff from hydro surgery news from 2006 and um they actually quote that in 19, 1988 uh hydrojets were used uh, in liver surgery so you know there's been different products out there um for either aesthetics and plastic surgery to sort of do safe liposuction using water jets and then there was you know um, laparoscopic surgery for removing uh, liver cells parenchymal tissue which is the soft tissue of the liver could be blasted away and leave the intricate structure of uh, ducts and vessels behind so this has been done for actually you know a very very long time in laparoscopy um, and you can see here that people were even thinking about it there. So here's one good example where the hydrojet will take away the soft pulp of the orange, but it will leave the connective tissue in between. And you can go back and look at this uh, at, your, at your leisure. So what Procept uh, did is they, they, they understood that you could use this kind of hydrodissection and use it through a cystoscope like device and what you could do is you could you could basically carve out the inside of the prostate uh, by using water jets so you use water jets uh, inside the prostate to remove that tissue instead of using electrosurgery or laser or, or or cryotherapy and they actually have a very nice video here let me see if i can find the nice video i'm going to get i'm going to come back to this in a minute but I think this is a really nice intro video down here that you that you can look at. And again, you can go to their site, which is procept-biorobotics.com because they couldn't get Procept because that was owned by another company. But let's just look here. So, so what have we got going on here to kind of orientate you? So you've got, in the rectum, you've got an ultrasound probe. And that's what's giving you ultrasound imaging here to see what's happening to the tissue. And what they've got here is they've got the sort of the cystoscope that goes in and that creates like a, a, a frame across the lesion or across the um, increased tissue. And then what they have is they have a second piece of this cystoscope that swings back and forwards like a pendulum. And, you know, you can change the angle of that and the amount of pressure that comes out and how long it actually acts on the tissue. 
So what they do is they, they basically mapped out the profile of which tissue they want to take away. And then what they do is that the water jet sweeps back and forwards as they retract the central probe. And what that does is it basically takes slices of the tissue away. And you can see there from the cystoscope image, it's basically wiping it away. So um, although I was being sort of a little bit funny that this is kind of like a uh, drain removing high pressure water jet, it's in a way it's, it's similar, but way more precise. And what they can do with this then is they can remove that excess tissue that's in there and the small slithers of tissue that come off with this are aspirated back out of the system and they come out of the system. So in effect, that's what this robot does. And you can control it on ultrasound and visually as you go along. And basically what you're doing is you're doing a very controlled or rather the robot is doing a very controlled resection of the prostate using a water jet. Um, so that is a really nice way of using water and, and and part of that is that it, it doesn't have thermal lateral spread so theoretically and through their data that they show with over 50,000 patients they get they get less erectile dysfunction less sexual dysfunction they get less um, incontinence than with some of the other methods that are used and that's one of the reasons why people like this and it is pretty precise so they had they had a system out for for quite a while which was the aquablation system and then what they've done since then is they've just recently got fda clearance on a new system and this is using a little bit uh, better planning and this is really about workflow there's not a huge difference in the actual way that the device works it still uses high pressure water to resect but what this is is this is a much nicer workflow and it's got some ai pre-planning so what have they done if you think about all the procedures that they've done over all the years they've collected a lot of data and understood the outcomes related to that data so they've understood if you go too deep or you don't go deep enough what that means for in terms of recurrence or in terms of incontinence and they've got that all thrown into their their uh, data machine and what they're then saying is when they look at imaging the the smart system can help to assist to to map out the best profile that you should do for the optimal result. That's the, the theory for it. It's still gonna to, to be proven out yet, but, but basically what it's doing is, it's working out what's gonna be the best profile within each individual's prostate to get the best results with the least complications, if that makes sense. So let's have a little look at the Hydros video here for the planning. Um, it's called First Assistant planning so what you've seen here with the touch screen that the operator is basically able to modify the suggested um, map that's done now this is very much more akin to something like a Mako than it is to a Da Vinci so if you if you if you take a lot of the spine robots and I'm not going to do I'm not going to do a huge amount of spine robots now I'll come back to that video in a second. On the spine robots, what you do is you do preoperative planning, you do uh, navigation, you do intraoperative imaging, and what you do is you set the boundaries of where the robot is going to operate. So it is more robotic in a sense than something like a Da Vinci. Um, but it's not fully automated and it's not fully autonomous and there's a big difference between automated and autonomous but this procept is much more akin to a in my mind to something like a more like a mako or for a large joint or for a knee or a hip um, or even some of the spine robots it's, it's much more akin to a navigated planned robot and the robot does more by itself than a um, than a intuitive would do by itself so you set you set the the, the course of where you're going to go and then the robot's going to basically follow that pre-planned pathway so you can see here that the the operator is setting all the points so that sort of intraoperatively they can set and guide where the procept is going to go um where the uh, hydros sorry is going to go and that is that is basically it um 
it's it's a robot that basically uses a water jet to carve out your prostate and they have some nice clinical data around this so uh, again i would encourage you to go to their site and look at this um but basically uh what what they're showing is that they, you know it's safe it's very safe um and they're looking at three things they're looking at incontinence um they're looking at erectile dysfunction and they're looking at ejaculatory dysfunction which is often retrograde but not not only retrograde and you can see that they've actually got um very very low rates of incontinence or what they call de novo incontinence. If you had incontinence before or, or you had some problem before, then they don't cure incontinence, as it were. Erectile dysfunction, which is one of the biggest, um, if you actually look at the data that's out there, one of the biggest reasons that people don't take um, a, a BPH surgical procedure is because they're really scared about erectile dysfunction. They don't want to trade off um, urinary retention for erectile dysfunction. So they, they avoid it. Whereas this is actually showing incredibly low rates of um, erectile dysfunction. And it's still got ejaculatory dysfunction. It's got some levels of that in there, but it's, it's fairly low. Um, the water two is a little bit higher than I would, would have liked, but, um, but they've actually got fairly low rates uh, there as well. And then if you look at their efficacy as well, and you can go in there and look at this, uh, th they start comparing to things like TERP, and you can go and look at the the publications that are in there. And I think that this is um, a really nice overview of um, that. They have a nice overview of what they what they do in there. And it's a great alternative to I, I certainly me personally. Um, and there's a high chance because a lot of men get BPH. Uh, but if, it, if I had a benign, if I had BPH, then I would definitely consider a proset procedure uh, as opposed to a um, TURP. I've never liked TURP at all for a few reasons. And again, we'll come a little bit to the robotics. Like any surgical procedure, um, part of the outcome is down to the technique used. So TURP in itself and the the um, the fact that you use electrosurgery within the prostate. But a second thing um, is the operator's capability and skill. And we talk a lot about, and it's not a word that I love that much, which is democratization of skill sets. But what, what I think is, is I think that um, what robots like Procept can help to do is to remove the variance that's down to just manual skill. So, I think that for me, again, um, you know, having a, a robotic procedure like this, which has got some smarts in it, it's pre-planned, it's got, you know, a good application of technology rather than using electrosurgery, it's using non-thermal ablative technologies. Um, and it's got a it's got a, a robot that's basically doing it so that the the maneuvers that are done inside are extremely precise and pre-planned and, and to a plan. Now, if you screw up the planning, of course, you're, you're not going to get great results. But generally, and again, the Hydros uh, compared to their older system is trying to give a little bit of smarts in there to give better guidance to the users so that they can plan out and map the procedure ahead of time faster and they can make just minor adjustments where they use their clinical intuition and their clinical insights to change that but for me personally i think this is an, an, an awesome alternative and i and again i think it's um i think it's a really good um um use of robotics um a couple of quick things just while I, again um I want to I want to go to my main scene here right so one of the things that uh, is different is that you've got this um, new consumable which means that basically you've got the the probe that they use to do the aquablation is now in a disposable consumable for convenience and again pretty pretty much on that because I, you know anything that's got lumens within lumens within lumens and you're trying to be precise coming down to the reprocessing for the cleaning eh, not brilliant on the ever on the cleaning when you've got thin small lumens the water jet nozzle on this is really has to be precise for it to get the kind of tissue effect that you want to get every single time so i think their data may have shown that having a disposable consumable is better um, and again just from turnaround if you're doing multiples of these so there used to be a thing in stafford and everyone's going to hate me for saying this called wet willy wednesday and they would just bang through sort of 10 terps in the morning. So if you were going to have a session in an ASC or something like this, where you're going to 
crank through 10 of these quickly, having a disposable on the end of it, which means that you don't have to wait for the turnaround or you don't have to have you know, 10 of these sitting around, especially a high precision uh, water jet system, I think just makes sense. So uh, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, they're just trying to make money on this. I, d I don't think they are, actually. I think that this is the sensible way for Procept to implement their technology to make sure that you get a fresh clean with a really precise nozzle every time there's a lot of pressure going in these so, uh, um, and then the second thing as i say i i just like that what they've done with the console and you can see here that you've got a, a trigger switch so it's not autonomous okay it's automated but not autonomous and this is something i'm going to talk about a lot when i talk about spine robots i'm going to talk about dental robots i'm going to talk about some of the other robots is where does where does automatic become autonomy is different but what you, what you should know is that the, the, the clinician here, the urologist, is always in control of this device with their foot on the foot pedal. It's, it's what, like a dead switch. So if they ever lift it off, the system will stop immediately. So if they see something that they don't like, then they will uh, immediately see it. Now let me see if I can zoom in here for you. Right. So on the screen, by the way, just to see, you've got your ability to set up the navigation. What you see during the procedure is you'll see... Um, the ultrasound image which takes precedence on this because I think that that's the main thing that, that the urologist is relying upon that's the prostate in there by the way um, and what you've also got though is you've got um, a cystoscopic view so you're, you're getting twin views with this system you're seeing an ultrasound view as it's doing it and it's doing its movements back and forward and you'll actually see the cystoscopy view as well so you can see the direct application on the tissue why is this important because if you were to get excessive bleeding or there was something that was a problem in there the the urologist can step in and, and intervene on any of that bleeding that would potentially happen it's you know it should be a rare complication but it can happen you wouldn't see that so much um, on the ultrasound but you would see it uh, very much on the main camera view um, and that is about it uh, they do have a lot of clinical data 150 peer-reviewed publications go and look at them quite interesting and 50,000 procedures um, this is another interesting thing that I just do want to talk about on um, on the hydros system is that it's fda first and this you're going to see more and more on, on the world of robotics that you're going to see fda first mdr has just made it so difficult for a lot of these uh, procedures uh, or or systems to get clearance so you're going to see more and more fda firsts coming um final thing just if you're in the united states is that the you know any technology that you introduce has to get reimbursement and um, there is two things there's coding so what's the codes that's used to give you the payments and what's the coverage i.e who says yeah you might have a code but i'm not going to pay it you got to look for both coding and coverage and uh, you, you'll see um, that there is reimbursement there i'm not going to go through it now because i know i have a lot of international visitors there but if you go to their website go and look at their uh, reimbursement if you're in the u.s very interesting and i will leave you with this beautiful shot there of the hydros um yeah so that's it really I, I just today wanted to go into um different types of robots so not all robots look like a da vinci xi i think that's an important thing for us all to understand and um i am going to do this whole series on uh different robots to try and give us a bit more education around other robots that are out there I really like the Procept robot. I would personally have it. And this, you know, I'm not paid by them in any way, shape, or form. I'm not even, not even talk to anyone from Procept. But I think it's just from me, from, you know, my knowledge as a physiologist, um, having been in surgery for many years, having dealt with urology for a long time, seen a lot of terps in my time. I, I just think this is a slightly kinder and more precise way of doing it. And especially as, you know, you can't always get to choose your urologist. So, bringing robots into surgery or into dentistry or into um, neurovascular is going to help because you're going to start closing that bell curve down and uh, reducing the variance that's through uh, user variance so I, I do like it so if you found this useful please 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 go and give a thumbs up on the youtube channel i know quite often we just watch these videos and then move on to the next video a thumbs up would really really help me on the channel uh, follow me so subscribe and turn your notifications on because i'm going to do a lot of these over the next couple of months 
uh, will give you that. And please, if you want to support me, go to my blog and put your hand in your pocket, get the 20 euros in and you'll get tons and tons of free information, of course. But there is a lot of exclusive information in there that I reserve just for the people who get the blog. And um, again, part of, the, part of that is uh, because I, the bots suck up everything. By the way, if nothing's behind a paywall, in case you're ever doing a blog or anything, the bots can suck up everything. And they do. And they, I, I found some of my articles just get literally sucked up and republished it on somebody else's blog. So having that paywall there just stops that. Really easy. Throw your credit card in. 20 euros. Uh, please support the blog. And it'll encourage me also to do much more uh, blog articles. Got a load of those coming over the next uh, uh, next sort of three months, six months, and twelve months. I've got a massive list of stuff that's going to be on spine robots. It's going to be on the new emerging systems in soft tissue surgery. It's going to be on dental robots. It's going to be on endovascular, endocardiac. It's going to be robots for um, neurovascular. Some of the really interesting systems that are coming there as well. So any support will really help me. And again. Um, Thank you very much uh, for coming to the MedTech Mavericks podcast and I hope to see you soon with another robot. Take care.